Strong's View Christian Church. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Um, there was a MS he has sent me to Lord, heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance. <laughs> To the cat, let no man deceive you. And recovering of sight to by the any blind, means, for the day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Strong Spiel Christian Church. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone to Strongsville Christian Church. Uh, the message that the good Lord gave me is you only live once. You only live once. God gives us guidance. To establish boundaries with loved ones to maximize this life. Now I use the word loved ones because that could be family, it could be friends, it could be people from the church that are not saved, that are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Either way, as you're, if you're a Christian and you want to maximize this life that God has given you, you have to have boundaries with people. Amen. You have to have boundaries. And again, you know that our God is a God of balance. See, I think Satan will have the Christians on two extremes to take us out of balance where he will have us to the point where we have no boundaries with no one, no matter what. You know, our, we're, we're just an open door. Our heart is not guarded. Our mind is not guarded. Uh, we just say yes to everyone. You know, Jim Carrey did a movie. It was called, I think it was called Yes Man. Or uh, yes, yes Man, I think it was called the movie. And basically it was a cult. And in this cult, people would just say yes to everything. No, it didn't matter what it was. And it didn't matter how crazy it was. They just said yes to everything. Uh, do you want to go rob a bank? If, if anyone asks you to do anything, you just say yes to it, right? Do you want to go buy, rob a bank? Yes, and go rob a bank. Do you want to go get a motorcycle? Yes, go get a motorcycle. Do you want to quit your job? Uh, you should quit your job. Yes, I quit my job. You should sell your home. Sell your, just there's no, no discernment, just yes blindly to everything. And that's how the devil wants us where we don't have no boundaries to no one. We have no, uh, no, no reg regiment. You see, on a moped, they would put something called a governor on the moped or, or even on uh, the, what do you call them? Those things that, the go-karts. They had governors on the go-kart. Why? Because it's a small little, uh, little thing, right? A little uh, vehicle. And they don't need you going 120 miles an hour on a little course because you're going to kill someone else or kill yourself. So they put a governor on it, which means that it, it, there's a boundary to how fast you should be going on a go-kart, let the church say. And that's how the devil wants us with no governor, no boundary. Go as fast as you want. You see, that's not wisdom. The other extreme the devil wants people to be at is he wants people to have boundaries everywhere. Just put up walls like the wall of China everywhere. Just no one can get it. I, I'm not answering my phone to no one. I'm not returning no text messages, no emails. You can't talk to me, nothing. Just you, everything is boundaries with everything. They, they have to walk through like an Olympic hurdle to get through all the boundaries that you set up. You ever see the hurdle when they're running, they're hopping over the hurdles? That's how they got to be to get to you. They feel like just to say hi. You see, that's not wisdom either. God, God, that's not life. That's not living. Do you see how the one takes you down to the road of self-destruction and the other one takes you down to a road of depression? Neither one of those is. The, God gives us guidance. See, a lot of times... People play victim of their family members who abuse them, manipulate them, take advantage of them. Well, look, if all those things might be happening to you, it's because you have no boundaries. 
You have to learn to value this limited time and this limited life, and you need to know who to have. Look, some folks, you need to, like I said about the hurdling that they got to go through. Some people, they need to go through those hurdles to get to you. Amen. By the time they finally get to you, they should be exhausted. But there's other people that they should have quick, easy access to you. Why? Because you know that they're in a place where they're not going to destroy you. They're not going to tear you down. They're not going to uh, mess you up. They're not going to discourage you. They're not going to beat you down like the devil. Amen? And I learned this one thing. When you start establishing boundaries with you, with other people, they start to respect you more. But if they know there's no boundaries in, in, with your relationship with them, guess what? That respect level goes down. Shouldn't be like that. That's not fair. It, you know, it shouldn't, should, people should respect you. Look, you can spend all your life trying to change other people, or you can change the way you deal with other people. Which one takes less energy? Changing all the flaws and all the character defects and all the, 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 the demons and the bad thinking and all the bad policies that people have. Going to changing the whole world by force. Or changing the way that you allow people to have access to you. See, that's one of the problems with Facebook. They can video cam you at 3 o'clock in the morning. Amen. There's no boundaries there. Actually, Facebook, actually, even Facebook recognizes that people need boundaries. That's why you could take, there's a function on there where you could put uh, not available. Amen? Sometimes you need to make yourself unavailable to people and available to God. I want to tell you today that you only live once. In Matthew 10, 35, Jesus put it this way. He said, for I have come to turn. A man against his father and daughter against mother, a daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be them in another country that you never have to deal with. No, no, no. It says a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Now, that could be literal. That your, your enemies can literally live with you. Or it could be someone that has access to you. It could be your neighbor. It could be, you know, it could be anyone. Amen? But own household, no matter how you slice it, it deals with someone that's close to you. Amen? Now, if Jesus tells you that these are going to be your enemies, what does that mean? We should have some boundaries. We need to learn the love from above to live the best life on earth. Now, just because you have boundaries with someone doesn't give you an excuse not to forgive them. It doesn't mean that you don't love them. In fact, in order to properly love someone without enabling them, you have to have proper boundaries. Amen. That's what the love from above is. It gives us wisdom on how to deal with different relationships according to the word of God. We need to learn the love from above to live the best life on earth. Matthew 10, 37 says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. See, there are some people that they have someone in their life that they love beyond love from above. It's love from earth. It is a fleshly, carnal-minded love, and that love goes past godly love, and it goes into ungodly worship. And when people worship someone to that point, they no longer will allow themselves to be led by the Holy Spirit and hear and adhere to the Word of God. And Jesus is saying, no, I don't want someone to have that control over you. The only person who should have that control over you should be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit whose job 
whose nature, whose character is to allow you to have freedom and to comfort you and to guide you and to teach you into all truth. I know your mama might be great, but no one can replace Jesus. And look at what he says. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Again, the devil would have us to be on two extremes. Where you either don't love your family at all. Or you worship your family. Do you see that? He says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And, and basically, there are some cross that we have to take up by putting boundaries with some of our loved, loved, our loved once. Some of our loved ones will cause us to take up our cross. Well, when we give our life over to God, Satan loses control over us and we find freedom. Matthew 10, 39, the Bible says it like this, Whosoever, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whosoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Amen? You only live once. Who are you going to live your life for? Are you going to live your life for yourself, serving your own will, or are you going to lose your will and live your life for Jesus and serve him? Amen. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Entitlement mentality cheats us from appreciating the blessings God assigned to us. Amen. Some people live their whole entire life in a disorder, mental disorder. And in this, a lot of times it's an upbringing. It's the way that they were raised. Their parents never, the, the parents spared the rod. The parents didn't discipline them. And you have these, these man-childs growing up. Growing up with a sense of entitlement and they don't realize that they're being cheated from what they have. They're always wanting that which they don't have. And when you have an entitlement mentality, you don't really value your life that God has given you. You see, the miracle of the two fish and the five loaves wasn't about an entitlement mentality. It was about someone that had a limited supplies and he was more concerned about other people that he was willing to give the limited amount that he had to other people. And, 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 and especially giving the limited amount of supplies that he had to Jesus. And by doing that, Jesus was able to take the limited amount that he had and perform a miracle and able to serve thousands of people. And you see, when you have an entitlement mentality, the opposite takes place. You don't see any miracles. You don't have no peace. You don't have no joy. And you actually feel tortured and tormented and never valuing what you already have. Entitlement mentality cheats us from appreciating 
the blessings God assigned to us. You see, one of the first things that God taught me as a newborn believer in Christ Jesus was to be content. Be content with what I already have. And the interesting thing is that God taught me that lesson to be content even when I was in jail. Even when I was locked up, even when I was incarcerated, I learned to be content with nothing in jail but toilet paper and a Bible. God anointed me, filled me with the Holy Spirit, not to raise the dead, not to speak in tongues, not to preach or teach, not to pastor, not to raise the dead, not to heal the blind. God overflowed me with a powerful anointing like a wind to be content. Which is evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. Entitlement mentality cheats us from appreciating the blessings God assigned to us. And 2 Kings 5.20 says, But Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, a man, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian in not receiving at the hands that which he brought, but the Lord, but as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So here you have the story of Elijah, who he was summoned to heal Gehazi, who was an important official for the king. And Gehazi came, and he did what Elijah said eventually. And he dipped in the Jordan River several times, and he got healed through the obedience of the word of God, through the man of God. He was able to live a life that he never dreamed of. His life, no matter what position he had, no matter how powerful he had, no matter how much riches he had, no matter how much success he had, he wasn't able to live the life of joy and peace because of his leprosy. He had a, a, a sickness, a disease in his flesh that stopped him from appreciating as a position all the things that God has given him. He wasn't able to see when you when you don't have no peace and you're in pain constantly. It's hard to appreciate the things that God gave you when you're in constant pain. You see, and the man of God delivered him from that, gave him a new life. You see, that's what God wants to do for us. He wants to give us a new life in Christ. He wants to heal us from the deep rooted pain, deep rooted pain that we occurred through our years of living on this earth. You see, you might not have a natural leprosy, but there may be a spiritual leprosy that you're suffering from, and God's saying, I could take it away from you. You only live once. And so Gehazi gets healed of leprosy Naaman. Naaman gets healed of leprosy by the hands of Elijah. And Gehazi, he felt that it was an abomination for his master or his pastor to not collect money from the person that was healed. In other words, Gehazi felt entitled. You see that? He felt that he deserved a reward for what God did. He had nothing at all to do with the healing. You, let, let me, let, let, let's just present it to you this way. If you remove Gehazi from the entire story of the Bible... Naaman still would have got healed. If Gehazi was never born, the man of God still would have done what the man of God did. 
and Naaman the Syrian still would have been healed of leprosy. See, Ge Gehazi, he thought so highly of himself that he felt entitled to a reward of a prophet. And here's the thing. It's not to say that there never would have been a reward. You see, God wants to test our heart to see, are we living this life for the Lord? Are we living this life for the reward Amen. on this earth? Jesus said, don't stack your riches on this earth where man can steal it and rob it and all that sort of thing. He said, stack your, your rewards and riches in heaven. Amen? It says, Behold, my master has spared Naaman, this Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought, but as the Lord liveth, I will run. See, now he brought the Lord into the picture. Lord had nothing to do with this situation as far as him trying to feel entitled to something that he was. Isn't that the way that Judas felt? Judas felt that he was entitled to 30 pieces of silver, willing to betray the Lord? Isn't that the way that the, the married couple, when they held back the property, and, God, and, and Peter said, you have not lied to man, you lied to the Lord. You see, they felt entitled. You see, people who feel entitled, they're never going to live a life that God has for them. And they're never going to appreciate that which they already have. They're always looking for that which they don't have to satisfy them. And I'll tell you what, I've incurred, occurred a lot of things on this earth in my short period of time. And I learned that everything that I got that I'd never had before, that I finally got, it only gave a fleeting joy, a fleeting satisfaction that only came and gone like the wind. And no matter what I got that was new, it always did the same thing. So then I learned that God is really true when he says, I've learned in all situations to be content. Amen. Amen. And here you have Gehazi. Look at Gehazi. I will run after him and I will take somewhat of him. <laughs> Look, if Gehazi didn't have it, Gehazi is the clinical definition of entitlement mentality. And you see, now we have way mobs of people running around with that Gehazi mindset. I will run after him, and I will take somewhat of him. Look, that's how he wants to live his life. He didn't say, I want to give to him. I want to pray for him. I want to tell him that it was the Lord who healed. None of that. I will take somewhat of him. And 2 Kings 5.23 it says, And Naaman said, look, even he was a Syrian, wasn't even a Hebrew, wasn't even Jewish, didn't even know of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and none of that. And even still, he had enough wisdom to say, be content. And Naaman said, be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garment and laid upon the two of his servants and they bare before him. And when he had came to the tower, he took them from their hand. See, basically all the, the gold and the silver, or the, the silver that he got the two talents worth, Right? He didn't want to look, appear to be greedy. See, a lot of times people with the entitlement mentality, they want to have a certain image that they're not greedy scoundrels. So he waited until he went around to the towers to, so that, that, that Naaman didn't see him. He, he wanted his servants to take the bags of silver and so he would look like, you know, I'm not sweating that, that two talents. You know? And as soon as they went around the court, give me that. What is two talents? What, what's the big deal? Well, there's a little bit, of, uh, little bit of debate about how much value is two talents, but basically two talents is around approximately $2.5 million that he ran after, that he walked away with. Amen? It sounds like, man, Gehazi got it together. He got himself some $2.5 million. I would have ran after him too. Because, you see... 
He thought that that was the right thing to do. Uh, there's a guy right now, uh, what's his name, Mark, uh, what's that guy's name, Mark? He, he does all the YouTube videos. Mark Dice. Mark Dice will do some videos where he'll go out in California and he'll offer the liberals out in California, he'll offer them a Hershey's chocolate bar or a silver bar, right? And he'll offer them, they could take either one that they want. And basically what he's showing is that the people don't even see the value of a silver bar that they chose a chocolate bar over a silver bar worth $100. And so they chose a, a dollar uh, Hershey's bar over a hundred dollar silver bar, right? They, they, he was showing that these people don't know really what's going on. <laughs> but Gehazi saw the value of that $2.5 million worth of silver, right? And it says as soon as he went around the, the towers, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house and let the men go and they departed. Living for materialism is spiritual leprosy. Living for Jesus is true wealth. In 2 Kings 5.25 it says, But he went in and stood before his master. Elijah said unto him, Whence camest thou, Gehazi? And he said, uh, thy, thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee? When the man turned against from his chariot to meet thee. See, I love this. People think anointed pastors are clueless what other people are doing. They just think, God said, I will let your sins be found out. I'll even have a bird tell it. Look, when you're doing something, God is giving you time to repent and get it right. Amen. Not go to the man of God and lie straight to his face like God ain't speaking to him. Amen. If it's a real man of God, he, his heart went with him. Amen. Amen. He said, went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee. Is it a time to receive money? Now, look at this context right here. He's not saying that there's never a time to receive money. He's not saying God will never provide for you. He's going to leave you down and out in strength. He's just saying right now, is this the time to receive money? And receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and maidservants. He's, he's saying, now's not the time. You see, this was the time to glorify Jesus. To glorify the Lord. The best part of this life is leaving others better than we started. Amen. In other words, those who you have loved ones, when you die and go on with the Lord, are you going to leave the people that come behind you better than the way that you came? And it's not, it's not restricted to materialism. Yeah, it's, it's nice to leave other people materialism, but are you going to leave them spiritual examples in which a way that you lived your life to... Guide them in the right way to those that are with you. Did they see that you were living as the salt on the earth? Did they see that you were living as the light on the dark earth? The people at your job, do they see, do they look at you as a Christian, as a man or woman of God? The people in your church, do they see you as a hypocrite or do they see you as a on fire for Christ, born again believer, sold out to Christ? When you die, what is it that you're going to leave behind that people are going to be better than the way they started? And I want to tell you again, you only live once. You only live once. In 2 Kings 5, 27, it says, The leprosy thereof of Naaman shall cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. So it wasn't just that Naaman got the leprosy. You see, what good is having $2.5 million worth of silver if you can't even appreciate it because now you are cursed with leprosy? See, Naaman had the $2.5 million worth of silver and more. If he could afford just to squeeze that off, that means that he was loaded. No matter how much he was loaded, it's still didn't help him. He still had a plague of leprosy. And he, truthfully, he probably would have gave it all away just to get rid of it. 
And Naaman, with the entitlement mentality, all he wanted was the silver at the expense of disobeying God. And now the consequences for that was that he got leprosy and his family, his children got the leprosy. See, that's the thing, folks. Whatever you do, it's going to affect other people. You're either going to leave people better than better off than when they started to know you, or you're going to leave them worse off. Amen? And Luke 12, 15, look at what it says. It says, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. You see that? Life doesn't consist in things. A believer without the Holy Spirit is like a fish without water. And I'm going to be closing soon, folks. A believer without the Holy Spirit is like a fish without water. This is why so many churches are operating in fear. That's why when you go into them, you feel like you're walking into a federal building, not a house of worship. You feel like you're walking into a jail and not a healing institute, a place of God. It's not like a church anymore. You walk in, you got to line up to get your temperature checked. You got to uh, take a shower and uh, sanitizer. You got to take on a mask and you got to wear a hazmat suit. And the people who are supposed to be laying hands on other people and praying for their healing, they got masks and hazmat suits on themselves. What type of faith is that? A Christian with no Holy Spirit has no life. See, the Holy Spirit produces life and that much more abundantly. There is no life without the Holy Spirit. You ever see a fish outside of water? Me and my wife, we saw a hammerhead shark uh, on the beach of Florida. And we looked at that. It was a beautiful, beautiful shark. Had the hammerhead and everything. And, and we saw the shark and it was just looked pathetic. You think of a shark, how powerful it is and how strong it is and how much muscle a shark has and the beauty of it and the hammerhead and how it had his eyes positioned and you just think how great of a creature that is. In water. But when you take the same majestic creature and you take them outside of water and, and you put them on a beach where there's no water all you could do is feel sorry for it. It's gasping for breath. It's not going anywhere. All of the design and the functions that God created to have, the, 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 the scales, the skin, and the, the dynamics of that fish, the fins, it's good for nothing outside of the water. You take the greatest whale, a big, huge whale, and you look at it and the water and you, you see how it opens up its mouth and it swallows in all the krill and it takes in all the fish and, and it comes up and, and it blows out all the water from its blowhole and it, it makes a bubble nets and captures fish just from the oxygen that it exhales. And you think what a maj majestic creature that God created. How wonderful it is in the water. But then when you see a whale off and beached, Stuck on the beach, it's dying. Has nowhere to go. All you could do is pity it. And you see, that's how Christians are without the Holy Spirit. All you could do is just pity. Yet they, are, they believe, but they don't have any Holy Spirit. So they believe, but yet they're in fear. They're in torture. They're not living the way that God designed them to live. Acts 19.1, you see an example. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. You see, they were disciples. That's great. You got a lot of disciples right now without the Holy Spirit. They believe, but there's no Holy Spirit. 
He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when a you believed? And they answered, no. We have not even heard that there was, that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptized did you receive? In other words, what kind of ritual did you go through? What kind of religion? See, there are a lot of uh, denominations out there. They believe in the Bible. They believe in good teachings and preaching, but yet they exclude the power of the Holy Spirit. They believe that it's all dispensational scripture. They don't believe that God is a healer. They don't believe that God is a protector, which is why they live just exactly like the world. The only difference is they have some morality to them. And they dress a certain way and they go into a church, but, they, but they, their, their lifestyle is just like the world. So what baptism did you receive then? They said John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, no. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You see, they thought that they got baptized the way that John was baptizing him and he's saying you gotta catch this here what baptism did you receive we received John's baptism he said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance in other words they didn't repent of their sins they probably got baptized in the water and they probably professed Jesus but they didn't repent you see if you don't repent of your sins the Holy Spirit ain't coming to live to you with you when you're living in disobedience, let the church say. See, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus, on hearing this. You see that it wasn't being dunked in the water, which is great, but on hearing this. What did they hear? They heard the truth that you need to repent of your sins. And on hearing that, Look what happened. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. No, Paul didn't dunk them in no water because there is no Holy Ghost in the water. The Holy Ghost is in Jesus, amen, that he sent to come to us when we repent. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on them, they spoke in tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 men in all. Strong's view, Christian church, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Um, there was a MS he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives let no man deceive you and recovering of sight by to the any blind, means for the day shall not come the except there come a falling away first strong spiel christian church